Hey, Pamela. Hello. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Happy Rosetta Waking Up Day or Martin Luther King Day or whatever it is you celebrate in Canada today. Oh, we've celebrated Happy Rosetta Waking Up Day for hundreds of years now in Canada. It's really a national uh, <laughs> national holiday. Yeah. Uh, well, we don't do Martin Luther King Day here. So I was actually talking with Susie about that. She's um, our producer. Um, and she, we don't have something like that in Canada, like a fairly modern... Uh, holiday to celebrate somebody who who did something really cool and brave. Like we don't. It's all like queens and. I'm I'm like, like suppressing so many comments right now. Um, I I, I guess I have to let one fly. So I guess in in Canada you just started out good, stayed good, and decided to avoid the ups and downs that we had down <laughs> here in America. Right. We we were the place where people went to escape slavery. So, yeah, I can see. Well, you're the country of no extremes. Just of no extremes. Good. <laughs> yeah, meh, meh. You know, that's Canada. Um, hey, I've got something really exciting to, sh to show you and to show people, which I'm really stoked about, uh, which is uh, we finally submitted... Uh, we've been recording these videos on YouTube, you know, what we call, we're calling the guide to space, and it's me and, and my buddy Jason Harmer, and we've been recording these videos, and we've done, like almost 70 of them now. Uh, they, you know, the short little explainers about, right. you know, how will the universe end and where are all the aliens. You know, the kinds of topics we like to talk about here. Yeah. And uh, we finally made a podcast version of it and put it into iTunes and stuff. And you got to check this out. Uh, let me find it here. So here's iTunes. And if you right now go to the, uh, the podcast section, into the new and noteworthy, and click on video, we are... Right next to the fat burning man, so we're the, <laughs> <laughs> but we are briefly the uh, one of the more popular uh, podcasts on on that iTunes, is which, awesome. I is, which I think science cool. wins. Over science ads. wins briefly, yeah. That somebody at iTunes appreciated, thought it was cool, made it new, and let's see how long it can go. So if you've been wanting to get those videos and you hate hate watching stuff on YouTube, which I totally get, uh, you can. You can download them from there. Although the files are a little big, I need to probably rebuild them. Okay, uh, right. So if you have no idea what this is, what you have stumbled into, you are watching a live episode of Astronomy Cast. Last week we talked about Arthur C. Clarke, the man. Um, this week we're going to talk about his ideas that either just the ideas in science or the ideas that he brought forth through his writing and what the implications have been. And we'll talk about those kinds of technologies. And because uh, because a lot of stuff you won't you won't believe the things that we you know do now that he thought of already or so. that he predicted he didn't necessarily originate but he was one of the first to promote and say this is our future. Yeah, he understood the implications of these technologies and yeah. knew how they would play out and could sort of understand holistically how how this would all come together. So yeah, no. Absolutely wonderful thinker. Um, so we do this as a sort of as part of this Google Plus Hangout that you're watching right now. We'll be recording our audio and then we will save it at the end. And uh, we almost lost it last week too. So hopefully this this week will be a lot more stable. Um, now, if you want to uh, interact with us, you totally can. So we have enabled the Q and A app. Now, if you're watching this somewhere on YouTube, it'll say "Be part of the conversation." Click to join live Q&A on Google Plus Hangouts, and it's this little yellow icon at the bottom left of wherever you're watching this video. So if you click that, it'll bring up a big window, and you'll see all the questions that people are submitting. You can vote on the questions you want, and we will let those collect over the course of the episode, and then uh, we'll answer your questions. And you can you can either what we talked about today, or whatever you want to know from Pamela. And, and we already see people commenting. Uh, there, there's someone saying, waiting again, twice in one day. Yes, this is my second Hangout. Uh, and the last one started at 4 a.m. local. So my brain is running slower today. You've been up since 4 a.m. earlier? No, no, no. I stayed all the way up until I went off air at 5.30 a.m., slept for a couple of hours, and now I'm back. Really? Yes. So you, you are operating on just a couple of hours sleep at this point. And like four cups of coffee, and I have a soda. So yes. this is going to be fun. I knew this was going to happen. That's why I picked this topic. Perfect. I, I, 
I will enjoy uh, <laughs> yeah, working through your paces. This is going to be good. Um, okay, great. So uh, do you have anything you uh, anything else to get out of the way, or should we set up to record? I think we're good. Okay, awesome. Um, say what? I am adjusting my mic one more time. There we okay. go. Okay. I am going to press record. I have pressed record. It is recording. I am mono. My levels look good. Testing, testing. Yep, yeah, I look good too. All right. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 331, Arthur C. Clarke's Ideas and Technology. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Good. I know you're a little tired. I, I am. Today is the day that the Rosetta mission uh, woke up from its many, many months of hibernation as it was out a little close to Jupiter and beyond where its solar panels could provide quite enough power for full functionality. And we did a live hangout with a bunch of school groups over in Europe this morning at 4 a.m. local. And we have now gotten the signal back from Rosetta. The mission did come back to life, did wake up from its hibernation. And now we're here to record a show on a completely unrelated topic. And my brain is, is full of science. Good. Well, I'm really glad that Rosetta woke up. That was, that was a little nerve-wracking because it had been offline for so long. So uh, before we get on, I want to give you one little quick piece of business, which is that we have now uh, uploaded all of our videos that we've been recording on YouTube for Universe Today. Uh, these are these short explainer videos that we've been doing, and we've put them all on iTunes. So if you haven't watched them because you don't like to consume your media through YouTube, I totally understand that, and now you can consume them on your podcatching software. So go to iTunes, or you can just go to universetoday.com slash video or universetoday.com slash audio, and you can download those that way. So more space goodness. And, and if you're like me and you can't do just one thing at a time, while you're watching Fraser's videos, pop on over to cosmoquest.org in another part of your screen and work on doing science while you're learning science. Perfect. All right, so in our previous episode, we introduced Arthur C. Clarke, the amazing man and science fiction writer. Today, we'll be discussing his legacy and ideas on space exploration. You'll be amazed to hear how many of the ideas we take for granted were invented or just accurately predicted by Arthur C. Clarke. All right, well, where do you, where do you want to start here? I, I think the best place to start is to mention a series of essays that he did in the late 50s, early 60s that were collected into Profiles of the Future, which was published in 1962. And, and the reason I want to start there is because these essays in this book came before Star Trek. And we're often saying, well, do we have this Star Trek technology? Do we have that Star Trek technology? And my husband and I, who've been re-watching all of Star Trek from uh, the original show back to the prequel Enterprise, have been laughing really hard at how the tablet technology of today so much exceeds the tablet technology that you saw in Star Trek, where they have a different tablet for every different thing they're talking about, and they're stacking tablets. Um, Star Trek isn't the only place where we can go to compare our past ideas of the future to our present reality. Profiles of the Future was really one of the first major here's what you can expect that was written and it was remarkably accurate and I think my favorite thing that it predicted was uh, Arthur C. Clarke pointed out that with the technologies of the future, the communications technologies of the future, someone will be able to be in Bali or Tahiti and working remotely, that a surgeon in Iceland will be able to perform surgery on a person in New Zealand. And these are the exact things that we're experiencing today as, as I've signed on with you from Indonesia in the past and my husband works remotely 
and we are starting to see uh, at least military applications for remote surgeries taking place. Right, and I mean the downside, of course, is you you're seeing military operations of remote remote drones. You're seeing people well, yeah. controlling weapons of war from afar. But but you're but that's exactly it. That this sort of there's this disaggregation of of people. You don't have to be in the same place to do your to do your work. He actually covered that quite a bit in Childhood's End as well, which I mentioned last week was my was one of my favorite books. That that pretty soon everybody has some nice house wherever they want to live in the whole world and then they commute instantaneously to wherever it is that they want to work or if they want to meet. And a lot of times they just they just hang out at home because, you know, so and this is your reality and my reality because I live in middle of nowhere, southern Illinois, where I can afford to have a horse and a fairly large house at the cost of a nasty attic apartment in Boston. And you live on an island off the coast of Canada, and neither of us are near particularly large metropolitan settings. Yeah, absolutely, and and I could work anywhere. So he definitely predicted that. Let's keep moving. What else? So the the other one that he he predicted was how geosynchronous orbits could be used for communication satellites. Uh, here, the the idea of sticking something in an orbit that was sufficiently high up, it would have a orbital period that was equal to the rotation period of the Earth. That idea, that's just math. But it was Clark that came out and said, you know, if we put something in that orbit and we put it above the equator and we put communications hardware on it or weather hardware on it, we can build a global network where the people on the surface of the planet and the satellites are constantly in sync with one another and we can use this to systematically beam information around the world. And to say that we depend on this technology is just an absolute understatement. I mean, as you said, there are the weather satellites that are constantly gazing at the same spot on the Earth and, and watching the storm systems and watching the clouds and the precipitation and relaying these full photographs of whole hemispheres of the Earth back for, for weather prediction. Um, and then Direct TV. Right, media. You know, we want to watch your TV. And so it's funny. I, I had a friend who didn't literally didn't believe in that we were launching satellites and there were things in space. And and I and I said to her, well, you know, when you take a satellite dish and you point it in the sky, what do you think it's being pointed at? Right? You are pointing <laughs> your satellite dish directly at a satellite. And and you're receiving the signal. If you point the satellite dish a little off to the side, there's no satellite there. And that's how you get your signal for your television. And, and what what I love is as you drive north to south in America, I've I've moved from like Milwaukee to, well actually moved from Texas to Milwaukee, uh, Michigan to Texas, with these north south drives as you're going through the remote parts of well flat farmland America, you see all the farmers have their satellite dishes that are all pointed at the space above the equator, and so the angle of the satellite dishes gets closer and closer to the horizon as you get more and more northward and points more and more upward as you go southward and it always makes me wonder if there's some uh, post technological world where future archaeologists in a day that we don't have satellites are digging through all of this wreckage are they going to think that we like worshipped the zodiac with metal dishes or something? Right, always pointing our metal dishes towards the zodiac towards the sun yeah, um, but yeah, no, I mean, here in Canada, where I am, our satellite dishes are really low, pointed really low towards the horizon, right? You you often have a problem with trees or buildings or houses because you can't get your satellite dish to point at the satellite, which is just above the horizon. And and this is one of the, the things that we've talked about in past uh, episodes is if you actually get too far north, you can no longer really use the geosynchronous satellite, so there, there's some crazy, impossible to pronounce orbits that have the spacecraft basically dipping really close to the Earth and then going out and passing over the polar areas very, very slowly, uh, basically parodying the geosynchronous rates before dipping back down and zooming around. 
Uh, one thing which you mentioned briefly about tablets and stuff is is if you go back and watch 2001, like literally back in the you know the the show that the movie that came out in the 1960s, they have an iPad in yes. the show in the movie. It, and in fact, you know, I know it was used as an example that that this concept of holding a little tablet and and moving it around with your finger had already been predicted long before Apple came out with the iPad that this was one of those inevitable technologies that we would want. And, and, Arthur C. and Clark helped predict it. And then there's the technologies we don't have yet that that we desperately want. Um, and I know one that you and I have talked about a lot is the space elevator. And while Arthur C. Clarke didn't come up with the idea of the space elevator, he put together all of the pieces of, well, let's connect to the surface, up to geosynchronous, and this becomes a low-cost way of getting society up and down. And this was discussed in his The Fountains of Paradise book. Yeah, totally. Um, and I know he did a bunch of sort of technical papers following on to that to show, I mean, this was not just here's a crazy idea that I've got in my story, but but actually he helped sort of do some of the math and sort of present the idea more fully. So he was he was pretty serious. And and what was, what's his classic quote? Like, people will build space elevators 50 years after people stop laughing at them, I think is the way it goes. You heard that one? That yeah, that quote I I don't know. The the one that I keep finding on multiple sites that I really like is one day we may have brain surgeons in Edinburgh operating on patients in New Zealand. When that time comes, the whole world would have shrunk to the point and the traditional role of the city as a meeting place for men would have ceased to make any sense. In fact, men will no longer commute, they will communicate. They won't have to travel for business anymore, they'll only travel for pleasure. And I think we're finding that there's still something very tangible and valuable about flying around the world to share a drink with somebody. But I read a report earlier today that at least here in the United States, teenagers are driving less and less because they just hang out with their friends online and it's the texting men mentality and you don't go to the shopping mall, you go to Amazon. And so our world is changing. And Cue the existential angst. <laughs> well, there's always been existential angst. Kids it's these days without driving to malls and hanging out. They're just Snapchatting. My day we went to malls. Snapchatting is a new form of, of terrifying. Um, <laughs> but I don't, that's... I don't know if Arthur C. Clarke predicted that one. All right, I let's keep moving. That. So, space <laughs> elevator. I mean, that is... I, I cannot wait for the space elevator. It will absolutely happen. Uh, count on it. So he will be vindicated. So so how long do you think it's going to be? I think it's going to be on the moon first. I think, you know, if we get serious about extracting resources from the moon, it's a, you know, it's a much easier process to put a space elevator on on the moon. To put one on Earth, it's like right at the limits of te of technological carbon fiber tubes. Yeah, I mean even with carbon fiber nanotubes, it's going to be a really tough project to to make that happen. So if it is even possible, 100 well, years? Have, I, would, have, I would think, yeah, 100 years. Have you read Kim Stanley Robinson's Red Mars series? I have, yeah. The, the one where their space elevator collapses and, like, does bad things to the surface of Mars has always been deep in my, my chest as a, oh, oh, terrorists or accidents or humans do things wrong, we're going to, like, belt our planet with carbon fiber and destroy everything along that line. Right, and I think we, we did a whole episode on space elevators, but I think the gist is, is that if you have a, an outward tension on the space elevator, then wherever it gets snipped, uh, you only, you know, the rest of it is going to try and take off into, you know, into solar orbit, but and whatever's remaining below the cut point is what's going to wrap around the Earth. But it could theoretically wrap around the Earth multiple times. So yeah, it's a there's there's some danger there with the <laughs> idea. Um, uh, so what what else did Arthur C. Clarke predict? So he he also predicted uh, the asteroid mining that Planetary Resources is getting ready to do. The idea of going out, exploring our solar system, and taking advantage of resources on the moon, on the asteroids, 
And the only disturbing part is when he was making his predictions, we still didn't know that much about the composition of the asteroids. And disturbingly, the more we learn about the asteroids, the more we learn there aren't that many of them that are worth grabbing and mining. So it, it's something that, that is definitely going to happen, but whether or not it's something that's going to be um, a new way to get massive amounts of resources is much more questionable. Yeah, and so this was in Rendezvous with Rama, right? And and so they they built this Project Space Guard to defend against asteroid strikes in the book, and then met you know, um, you know <laughs> Rendezvous with Rama. Um, but uh, what's what's great is that in the UK they there's a sort of um, uh, a space society called Space Guard. And they're looking to sort of do the same kind of thing that was defined in, in the book. But, you know, a lot of that, that preparation, trying to prevent uh, asteroid strikes is all, you know, NASA has gone full bore on, on putting surveys up and and uh, and now there's new missions in the works that'll, that will take that even to the next level. So, so this is all moving ahead. Mining them? Yeah. So you don't think that it's worth mining asteroids? No, I, I don't think... There, there's a difference between it's not worth mining asteroids and it's not going to be as lucrative and long-term a solution for getting resources as we thought. Uh, there, there's new uh, information from looking at the spectra of a variety of different asteroids, reflectivities, and comparing it to, of course, meteorites that we find on Earth and we're able to relate back to different asteroids. And it's looking like the number of them that have sufficient resources to make them worth all of the cost of going out, getting to them, digging into them, getting the resources out, is probably order of 10. Right. I wonder, though, I mean, you know, 10% of them are metal. I wonder if there are you know, platinum asteroids out there? Are there gold asteroids? Are there ones that are just chunks of How a valuable resource? How differentiated are yeah. they? And that's what we're still trying to figure out. Yeah. Um, so, so hopefully this is one of those times where our science, our early science results, and this is early science results, um, aren't entirely right. But it was a kind of sad day when that new set of statistical results came out. But yeah, because sure... you imagined your future as a as a crusty asteroid miner. No, no, I it wasn't that. It was more a matter of uh, if people go out and mine the asteroids, we'll end up with hollow asteroids that are great future space. Right, products. your favorite spacecraft design. Yes. Uh, yeah. No, I think being able to have these these uh, spacecraft sort of you know out there mining just it's just another great reason to build a spacefaring civilization. So if we can make it pay then that would unlock the whole thing. Because now if there's, you know, if there's profit, then can you imagine if the oil companies and the mining companies wanted to get to space? Well, the oil companies won't because there's not exactly dead dinosaurs tell in the asteroids. Tell them that there is. They tell them that there is. <laughs> that there's tons of dead dinosaurs in the asteroids. And they'll head off and, and mine those asteroids and we'll, we'll build a spacefaring civilization. What would be cool is if we figured out how to get helium out of it, the asteroids, but that's a different issue. Uh, what else? So those are basically the big areas where he made his, his impact was looking at how can we use technology to enhance communications and how will that change society. He also made other predictions like the idea of building space planes and being able to go from London to Australia in 25 minutes and the issues that most people may not enjoy that due to the difficulties of high G launch, fairly high G landing, and weightless nausea in between. Uh, so the, the space plane idea was one that he predicted and we're seeing that getting built today. Uh, we're not quite to the point of landing somewhere other than where you take off, but I'm waiting for Virgin Galactic to start doing its uh, around the world journey capabilities. Yeah, it was great. I participated in a hangout with the folks from, from Virgin Galactic because they were talking about their about their their plans. And you know, one of the things they said is like you you know that the spacecraft doesn't need to return to the same place that it takes off, right? Like it can go from Mojave, go up and take you on a really fun 
flight in space and then land somewhere else. Yes. And maybe it doesn't have to be so... Ex maybe it can take a longer flight. Like, like in addition to the space tourism side of it, you can imagine this future, that this is the way you move towards this future of these these uh, suborbital aircraft. There, there's no replacement for the Concorde, and no one's working on it right now in a big showy way. Yeah. But Virgin Galactic is not working on a replacement for the Concorde. They're working on something entirely new that unfortunately will make the current cost of uh, baggage look lame. Right, yeah. No, but I mean, <laughs> I think it's important to just recognize that Virgin Galactic is owned by Virgin Airlines. Virgin, there's, yeah. You know, the Virgin whole empire, but yeah, but also Virgin Airlines is part of this, and so they are an airline company, and they get people around the world. So I think if the more they can figure out the technology by sending people into, you know, high altitude and give them, show them a good time, they're going to learn a lot of lessons about if there's a viable actual travel method here. Um, okay, well, so here's one that maybe you may have missed, which is sort of all the work you did on uh, nuclear rockets. That's when I have to admit I did miss. Yeah, so when he did, um, uh, he thought about this idea, and this was like back in the 50s, about, about how you would use a nuclear reactor, an atomic rocket, and then you would use that to uh, propel high energy exhaust out the back of the, of the rocket. And, uh, and that kind of came true. The NASA tested out using uh, nuclear atomic rockets during... Um, uh, like the 1970s, the 19, 1980s, and they never really went anywhere. There's been a few recent rocket uh, sort of attempts, but a lot of the reactors and stuff have all been, been shut down now. So uh, that's a real possibility. And then the other thing is is that more like using these these nuclear reactors, like more the RTGs, but to as a power system for for you know really ambitious spacecraft. You know, like like imagine hooking up a, a nuclear reactor to a um, an ion engine, and right. think about and the kind of power you would get, and 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 sort of long duration space flight. So, and and the thing he didn't predict, and I don't think anyone could have predicted, was the problems that we're now having with plutonium fuel sources. It, it was, in the past, America made our own. We've now used up all of our reserves. We've been buying reserves from Russia. They're almost out. And now we need to turn back on our plutonium production for the correct refined version that we need for doing radiothermal, iso uh, radiothermal generators. And um, until we do, no mission to Europa no more missions to the outer solar system because as Rosetta found it's just a little too cold and not enough solar flux when you get out there so you really need to have nuclear well half-lifes are your friend they release heat and keep your spacecraft going now he came up with a few ideas as well that haven't happened yet but still seem perfectly viable and you know, we're just waiting for them to uh, to do. So now I've got a couple here. Now, do you have any of those of the future ideas yet, the ones that haven't come true yet? I, I'm waiting with fear and trepidation for the space elevator myself. Are you? Okay. So he wrote in Songs of Distant Earth about cryogenic suspension. And so the right. idea of freezing people for long-duration space flight in their hollowed-out asteroid. Um, and, uh, and so... You know, and that idea has sort of shown up quite a bit. Like if you watch um, Avatar, right? They, right. He's, he's frozen for the trip to Pandora. And, and we've seen it in a number of different science fiction books. Uh, we've seen it in various episodes of Star Trek where they find ancient cryogenically frozen this, that, or the other thing. Con! <laughs> but, but the issue that we keep running into over and over and over is, is essentially freezer burn. Uh, a lot of liquids that have high H2O content, high regular everyday water content, well, water is one of the few things that expands when it freezes and that has this nasty, tem nasty tendency to rupture cell walls, cause cellular damage. And while 
scientists have been working really hard to figure out how do critters like frogs safely hibernate in frozen winters. Um, we haven't really succeeded at getting truly large mammals. I think the largest they've gotten last I checked on the research was German Shepherds, uh, which are still fairly big, but uh, we're now starting to learn that just cryogenically freezing fertilized human eggs isn't as safe as they thought. There's a lot more uh, damage to the oh, eggs than had previously been understood. So freezing things is, is proving difficult due to stupid thermal expansion at cooler temperatures for water. Right, but even, you know, not necessarily trying to have it reversed. I mean, you see... Um people getting themselves frozen so that, you know, some disease and then in the future if, you know, maybe the, the solution to that disease gets figured out, they can be thawed back out and and cured, brought back to life, I right. guess. Now, it's a long shot, but at the same time, it's, you know, you're not going to be around to care about the time, so if it works, it works, and if it doesn't work, well, you paid your money, you took your chances. And, and the idea there is you basically fra flash freeze a human being as close to death as possible, uh, essentially so fast after death that all of the organs could have been harvested uh, for organ transplant. And since limited to no cellular decay has set in, uh, maybe you can be thawed someday and resurrected. I think that's the correct word yeah. in this case. Yeah. yeah. All right, I got another one. Have you got, you got any more? <laughs> okay, so, so in 2001... Uh, he wrote about uh, people moving their brains to computers, about backing up your brain. Right, and this this idea came back in the Battlestar Galactica series, uh, Caprica, the prequel series, and the the idea of how few terabytes of information can be used to basically quantify the human life, the question is, if you understand all the decisions that have been made in the past, can you predictively create an algorithm that replicates human thought by downloading all of that past memory? Yeah. Yeah, and so... I know, know this is something you're a fan of. I, well, hmm, I'm a <laughs> fan of this. Uh, I, I, am, I am a fan of us figuring it out. So I think it's really important for us to understand understand the brain and get us to the point that we can start to uh, communicate with the brain and computers, some kind of back and forth communication. And you're going to see in the beginning there's going to be a need for this for people with who've had brain injuries, and you can you know you can route around the brain injury and with a computer and provide people with the capabilities that they lost because of the injury. But you can imagine the next step is let's enhance, let's give you more memory, let's give you faster processing, and you can then imagine down the road the situation where you back yourself up or you transition yourself from meat to. But one of the things that allows human relationships to function and that's getting wrecked in some ways by the internet is, is the ability for memories to fade and things to heal with time. And, and if you have that digital memory, it, there's a lot of scary consequences. But I'm fully a fan of all the work that's going into figuring out how to do... Uh, mind-controlled prosthetics, mind-controlled yeah. communications systems for people who have various forms of locked-in disorder. The fact that we can now get people that we thought were in near vegetative states communicating via computers that simply read their brain waves is one of those things that brings up Clark's law of any sufficiently advanced technology appears to be magic. And we're hitting on that magical, miraculous technology. And this this is how it starts. This is the thin edge of the wedge. You start here with with helping people, and and then after a while, it just turns into uh, you know people just wanting to compete, make themselves better, and uh, yeah, yeah. There's no stopping this, but but we'll see how it all turns out, and what what will actually what is possible and what is impossible. Um. Okay, so I, there's a couple more, just little ones, um, <laughs> okay. uh, which was he he thought it would be possible to predict and prevent uh, earthquakes. 
working on it. Some porn working on it. I don't know. Yeah. Well, there's some porn and Italian scientists who actually got themselves into legal problems for failing to predict earthquakes. But there are a lot of scientists who are trying to figure out how to predict with more than a few minutes notice when the big one is coming, especially where we know that there's giant fault lines under so many high population areas all along the po- the Pacific Rim. Not there yet. The planet is a chaotic system. Yeah, yeah. So so the, the idea with this would be to uh, detonate nuclear bombs, of course, because that's, you know, that's how you fix every geoengineering problem, and you spot weld the plates together and then no, thank you yeah well and hopefully by doing that you then end up with other plates like other cracks opening up in other places but not maybe going through through your cities and stuff so this, this just reminds me of Venus where they they have the the pressure and temperature builds up builds up builds up and then we believe that there's sudden episodes of volcanism and I don't want to do that to our planet no thank you Right. So anyway, so that's uh, and that was in a book called Richter Ten. So I think that is the one people you know people want to know like which one is probably not going to work out. I think this is this is the one. But then of course, right? Anytime you say that something is impossible, then it becomes possible. And anytime you say something is possible, then it just becomes inevitable. So <laughs> anytime a senior scientist says something is impossible, it becomes inevitable. That's a, another one of those things that that Clark came up with. Pamela. Yes. You're a senior I'm not, scientist. I'm not a senior scientist yet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm you are. I'm a mid-career scientist. I think scientist. everyone listening I'm a will mid-career agree. scientist. All right. All right. All right. Cool. Well, I think we're out of time. So uh, thank you, Pamela. Thank you, Arthur C. Clarke, for everything you gave us. You are the best. One we'll of the best. See you next week. See you later, Fraser. And oh. now we save. Save. We we will be back to answer your questions once we have made sure this episode is not going anywhere. Yeah, we other yeah. than to our hard drives. Yeah, so last week, yeah, we kind of crashed halfway through the the episode, and so I had to stitch my the two parts together, and I had forgotten to do that when I passed it along to Preston, and so he gets back to me with. Your episode is missing the first 20 minutes of the uh, show. Yikes. Oh, jeez. Yeah. I'm glad I didn't see that. I would have had a very quiet, complete panic attack over here. Yeah. Well, you know, we're kind of lucky because we do these things as a live Google Plus Hangout. So we have a lo-fi backup if we need it. Yes. We, we've actually lost a couple episodes in the past due to, I think it was my stupidity each time. We have, yeah, like we we've, we've have had to use the audio from... From the hangout, I think once or twice. And I think we actually lost an episode once, our first or second year, because I saved over it when we did back-to-back <laughs> recordings. Right. We have we have at one point had to completely redo an episode from scratch due to, to re- stupidity. Just to re-record, yeah, because of file shenanigans. Okay. Yes. Well, I'm uploading, so I'm safe. Uh, you? Okay. I'm I'm good. All right, people, hit us with your questions. <laughs> um, so so. ATPL74 uh, commented at the very beginning of the show, how about Buzz Aldrin Day? It's his birthday today. Uh, I think that's definitely worth noting. So I noted I that, it. That's great. Happy Buzz Aldrin Day. And, and, and we, we, in Canada, we'll celebrate that. And then uh-huh. we have uh, Red5 2013 on Twitter saying, uh, when will we finally get a computer with the thinking capabilities of hell? Surely the one area where reality has failed so far. You know, I, I'm not sure we're ever going to get a computer that has the Turing test capabilities that that hell had um, that that also has the greatest potential. There, there's interesting things that can be done with big data. Uh, Amazon just processed a patent for predictive ordering where they're saying that they might consider in the future shipping things before you've actually ordered them because their algorithms know what you're going to order. Oh, oh, man. <laughs> and, oh wow. Um, so, so that's yeah, a little that's terrifying, weird. but 
I can, I can see people who are working in big data, the miners at Google, at Facebook, who know far more about us than is necessarily comfortable, um, being able to do lots of predictive algorithms that influence the market, influence politics, uh, that is wholly terrifying on many different levels. Um, yeah. But then the personality is different. Yeah, I mean that's you know you're not you're not interacting personally with a gigantic data mining operation, and right. it's not trying to throw you out the airlock. You know, it's <laughs> it's a so I think uh, we are. Uh, you know, we're definitely moving in that in that direction, but we're not going to end up with a computer that's going to be like a human, as you said. It's going to be this data mining m tool. It's Talking to the to the quantitative analysis, the data wonks. Yeah, it's a fancy hammer, right? It's still going to be a fancy hammer. You're still going to the hammer will be very complicated tasks. But and but I mean, for people like you and me, and for a lot of people who are knowledge workers. We're the next line that the computers are coming for. That the robots are coming for our jobs next. Yes, and, and one thing I want to point out is Hal H A L. That's one letter earlier than IBM in each case, and that was done quite purposely. Um, yeah. So I so uh, if you talk to, if you listen to Ray Kurzweil, he thinks that we'll have the first sort of full simulation of a human mind sometime in the next decade or so, within the next decade, you know, the end of the teens in the early 20s, um, and that it will be in your smartphone 10 years after that. So who knows? I, I'm amused by all of the quips that are programmed into things like Siri, and the more that the algorithms... Um, basically data mine our text messaging data mine Facebook tracks what we type and don't submit uh, I know yeah the normal human responses that's that's nothing more than a great neural network for learning how to respond to things here is a good question uh, could we convert Jupiter into a supercomputer no no it's a giant ball of spinning gas. Okay. I mean, there is this idea of, you know, in the future, we'll turn more and more of stuff into computers. Yes. That computers will end up being the most useful thing we can turn matter into. That, you know, it starts off as just raw material, and we just turn it all into computers. Whole planets into computers? Well, I, I, I think it depends. I, I can imagine a Coruscant future where a rocky world gets its silica crust turned into silicon chips. But as we look at Jupiter, it's a giant ball of spinning gas. And it's, it's cool and all, but uh, turning that spinning gas into something that is meaningfully conducting through whatever are the circuit gates of the future uh, I, I see that as much less likely. Yeah, you'd probably just take it and you'd take apart Jupiter and fire it into your fusion reactor and use it to power your, your Coruscant. There, there's our helium solution. Perfect. Um, Sean Griffith asks, what's the most interesting prediction that Clark got wrong? The, the bomb welding yeah. earthquake? Well, and I, I think a lot of the ideas on using nuclear weapons... Uh-oh. This is when Pamela's computer just dies. <laughs> this this happens once an hour for some reason. I'm not yeah. quite sure why. Um, so uh, what I was going to say is I don't think he could have predicted the hatred that people have for nuclear fuel sources and the way that we're very mm, limited yeah, on our ability. So here he was thinking we could use nuclear bombs as propulsion systems and we struggle to launch spacecraft like Cassini that have plutonium on them. Yeah, that's, that's interesting though, but I wonder if he's still going to be right that people are going to fret about it, but they're going to end up to embrace the atom 
the way they ought to? I think it's going to depend on what the full outcome of the uh, nuclear power plant that's uh, borderline meltdown in Japan. Yeah. Um, how that goes, I think, will predict how policies are made regarding the use of, of nuclear power into the future. Um, let's see. Have you got any more on Twitter or on some of your sources there? Not that I'm seeing right now. Okay. Um, uh, Leonardo Santos notes that I'm pretty sure I saw something about giant planets being transformed into computers on the game Mass Effect. I haven't. I, I know if I start playing video games, I get addicted and I have grants to write, so I Yeah, don't you should play. rectify that, though, with Mass Effect. You should watch that. You should play that game. Um, uh... But I don't recall that. But um, Daniel Ryan notes there's a movie coming out about the Ray, about Ray Kurzweil and that concept of implanting human consciousness into computers called Transcendence. It looks amazing. So here's a sort of philosophical question for you: uh, If you could transfer your consciousness to a computer, would it really be you, or would you die and it would just be transferred to the and some new robot would think it was you? Well, it, th this is the, the question of if a transporter accident causes two of you to exist, the two would very quickly diverge and become something different, simply because whatever is in the computer would have different sensory inputs, would have different experiential reference points, and so it might start as something capable of making the same decisions that I, I would make, but the longer the biological and the computer are separate from one another, the more independent they would become. But would you close your eyes as the person and then open your eyes as the robot person? Or would you just close your eyes forever and be killed and the robot person would open their eyes newly born? Well, this, this is sort of at the heart of the John Scalzi old man's war idea where they're transporting consciousness to genetically engineered bodies. and. I think that if the technology is sufficiently good, uh, the new life form in the memory transferred vessel would believe itself to be the original organism. Hmm. I don't, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think you would die. Um, that, that starts to get to the question of the soul versus the question of identity. Yeah, just a sort of continuation of your consciousness, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean soul's not the right word, but, um, like, you know, it's the same thing with a transporter, right? Like, would you hop in a Star Trek transporter, or is it a, you know, is it actually a transportation device, or is it a suicide booth? And that becomes the difference between uh, self-identity, which is based on the fi firings of neurons and whether or not you believe in something greater than the body. You people have joined the geekiest conversation ever. <laughs> um, uh, okay, here we go. So Renko Prozo says, I read about computer planets in the book Year Million. They mentioned using gas giants for the process. So I haven't, I haven't read that. Uh, oh, this is great. Uh, Jamie Orlando says, Dr. Gay, maybe a device on your network momentarily hogs your bandwidth, perhaps an hourly check for updates or something. So oddly, it doesn't matter what time I start the Hangout, I get about one hour and then it says, no, thou shalt type in your password. And so I think this may be something at the Google end because mm. when it dies, it's, it's telling me I have to validate who I am. Brian Simpson says, Amazon better not start automatically shipping me Teleview eyepieces. Um, they won't unless that's what you want and you're ready to buy them. Well, and the article I was reading this morning was saying that one of the things that Amazon had in it, its patent was um, if they shipped you something that you hadn't ordered, it would become a courtesy gift or something. And so then it becomes the how do I trick Amazon into right. shipping me things. Right, but their, but their data miner will have already thought of that and will have thought yeah. of the things that you're going to try and trick. And, yeah, no, it's going to be, you know... Never, never gamble with a uh, Sicilian while death is on the line, I believe, is the appropriate quote here. Exactly. Um, uh, Christine Grosner says, there's planets as computers in the Hitchhiker's Guide, of course. There's also a planet populated by intelligent mattresses, so whatever. 
<laughs> which is great. Yeah, the uh, well, I don't want to ruin the Hitchhiker's Guide. I need to reread reread that yeah. series. I just read them with with uh, with my kids, so I sat and and read the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy with my son, and he loved it. And then we watched the movie, and he loved that. So yeah. Yeah, I read them back in I think seventh or eighth grade, and I need to reread. It's been a few decades. Terry Bradford says, instead of mining asteroids, why not crash them into a, the moon and then pick up what you need? Because we like the moon. Speak for yourself. <laughs> no, so so the the issue, and and this is actually a topic that we have for a future show that I I think is in February or March. Um, clearly, because we're almost out of January. Uh, but but the issue is asteroids are fairly large. If you crash them into the moon, they're going to undergo a whole lot of chemical reactions. There's going to be a whole lot of melting. There's going to be melting of the moon. Um, it's not like you're just breaking them apart and causing them to go splat. You're actually liquefying them and splattering this, this crater blanket around a giant chasm you have just dug while causing all sorts of seismic activity. One thing that is interesting um, is I know NASA is considering a mission where instead of capturing an asteroid, because they're thinking about capturing an asteroid and putting it into orbit around the Earth, right. which is terrifying. Which is terrifying, yeah. I mean, you know, anything goes wrong and that bad boy is going to come down. But but what's neat is that anything left orbiting the moon because of the tidal forces will always crash into the moon. Right. And so you could put your asteroid into orbit around the moon instead. It's still close, but the worst case scenario is it's going to crash into the moon, and it's not going to crash very quickly because to be in an orbit around the moon, it's going to be only going, I don't know what its uh, horizontal rate is going to be, but it's not going to be super fast. And so right. you might not get that you know 17,000 kilometer per hour impact, you're going to get something that's just a couple of thousand kilometers per hour, and so maybe not so terrible. So so, so this is sort of an idea that's being kicked around by, by NASA, to park an asteroid by the moon, mine it there, as opposed to bring it to Earth. And, and I honestly think it's going to be companies like Planetary Resources that figures out exactly what we're actually going to do when not limited by congressional spending. Um... Michael Jobin notes that asteroids already litter the moon. I think that's a great point, yes. right? If, if what you want to do is find asteroid impact craters and mine them, they're there. And well, and if you just want meteorites, heck, go to Antarctica. As the glaciers melt, they're eons, well, that's, that's an overstatement, many, many centuries in some cases worth of, of meteorites are piling up on the surface and teams of scientists are going out, they are walking the ice, but as the glaciers melt, as the ice recedes, more and more things are getting revealed on the surface. Yeah, it's it's pretty astonishing you, you those missions. Like they go out on on uh, with like snowmobiles and they just they see a rock sitting on the on the top of the ice and they're like, that has to be a meteorite. Yes. There's no other source for where that thing could come from. And so I always think about the fact that all around us those rocks are actually meteorites, but we just we don't know because they just look like rocks, and and they also get weathered, right? I mean, the great thing about yeah. Antarctica is they won't get weathered; they get absorbed by the ice and they're there for a long time. I would love, you know, if any researcher wants to take me with them searching <laughs> for meteorites in Antarctica, I'm I am on board. Um, what's your time? It's twelve fifty eight. Okay. We'll do, we'll do a couple more here. Okay. Uh, Tom Nathy wants to know if androids dream of electric sheep. Yes. I think so. I want an electric owl. <laughs> uh, that, of course, is the Blade Runner, the original name for Blade Runner. Which it took me a long time to learn, actually. I felt oh. very stupid when I oh, found really? that out. Yes. Um... Hmm, okay. Josh Andrews says, wouldn't a moon space elevator be more difficult due to the slow rotational speed? No. 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 You that... have to put things in the right orbits. Hmm, yeah. Yeah, you would need just to have a counterbalance on the cable that provides the right level of tension. And the further you get away from the geostationary point, the the more tension you're going to get. But it's, no, it's, in, in fact, you could build a space elevator with um, 
spectra. It's like there's materials right now that you could build a space elevator with on the moon, no problem. You use the word spectra, which I take to mean light spread into a rainbow in a way I do not know that needs explanation. Uh, a Kevlar rope. Okay, thank you. I was trying to figure out how you built an elevator out of light, and my brain just light stopped. That needs Fairies to be and rainbows. <laughs> uh, Thomas Trinaker notes that in a 1010 book, they use a nuclear rocket in 1957. Do you read a bunch of 1010s? No. No? I mean, that's a Canadian, European kind of thing. It's They had them in America. I just didn't have them growing up. Hmm. And, and yeah, there's there's a lot of culture I completely missed. Yeah, I that's, was... like, that's like all we have. I grew up on a, like a hippie island, <laughs> so we had all these weird European... You know, books, Tintins, and Asterix and Obelix. Yeah, um, I, I know lots and lots of people that grew up in the States reading all of that. I, however, was in the land of Dr. Seuss and Golden Books and didn't really escape those. Uh, Graham Sticking says, Whatever happened to Eliza from Computown, New Jersey? One of the early attempts at artificial intelligence. Oh, did you ever interact know. with Eliza? Yeah, they, they actually had a version of her on display at the Boston Museum of Science for a while that I remembered playing with. Um, yeah, I don't know what happened with that. I know that they keep creating new generations of, of these the chat uh, more... Yeah, yeah. And, and it's getting to the point that some of them are pretty good, and you can actually find some on the Internet. And and like I said, even Siri's pretty good. Um, it, there's a lot of snark programmed into Siri. I think these things are going to pass the Turing test way before they have any right to pass the Turing <laughs> test. You know, this idea that if you can't tell that it's a computer, then then it might as well be treated like a an actual intelligence. Like they're just going to get so good. Um, like Watson, right? This is yes. this computer that that won Jeopardy. And now IBM is, you know, that was years ago, and IBM is still is pushing this technology forward. And so you're going to see that technology show up in all kinds of crazy places. So yeah, Watson's playing chess now, I think. I don't know what that. There was a someone said there was no, a commercial. No, go. It go? was go is the one thing they really? still haven't figured out how to. Yeah. It it takes the human mind still. Yeah. To to be a champion at go, it's because like there's just too many. There's like yeah. too many options, right? Yeah, yeah, amazing. Cool. Okay. Well, I think we're we've sort of neared the end of this hour. Why don't we wrap things up? So, uh, what's coming up next? Pamela? I think we're doing stellar collisions and their low prob low probability reality in the next episode. Awesome. Uh, and then we actually we've got a whole pile of topics that you've queued up. So I'm really you know some great great <laughs> topics there. I'm really excited. Um, and then what else this week? Uh, learning space Wednesday. We have learning space on Wednesday. I have to admit I'm in grant writing land, so that's that's where my head's going to be focused. Um, yeah. So so for those of you watching the omnibus budget slowly passing its way, hopefully through Congress. It does offer some hope for the funding of planetary science and astronomy, but the issue is programs have already been canceled, zeroed. I got a letter two weeks ago that one of my larger grants was getting zeroed due to sequestration. Um, and when you get a letter that doesn't even come from the PI, it just comes from a budget office. It's like getting stabbed in the heart. Oh, oh, and yeah. so we're still looking at potential layoffs in March. Right. Okay. Um, but that's Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> um, Friday, we'll be doing the Weekly Space Hangout. Yes. And uh, next Sunday, we'll do the next Virtual Star Party. And last night's Virtual Star Party was great. Uh, you say that every I week. I know, but like, I'm amazed. We, they keep getting better. Seven telescopes, two live views of the moon, two live views of Jupiter... Um, and then some great color views of Orion and the Horsehead Nebula, and yeah, I don't. Sometimes no, sometimes they they are not great. Sometimes they are <laughs> they are us stretching uh, a limited amount of resources the best that we can. And so it's a real joy when we've got a ton of telescopes and the skies are dark and everybody's bringing up stuff. Um, it's been uh, yeah, no, it's been good. 
And and for any of you who did hang out and hang on to the show, just uh, as a travel alert, I will be going to Pensacon in February and Science Online, so that's Pensacola, Florida and Raleigh, North Carolina. And so drop me a message on Facebook, Twitter or Google Plus and maybe we can meet up. Have a great time at Science Online. That's a great, that's a good time. It really is. Okay, well, thanks everyone for watching. Pamela, as always, thank you very much for bringing the brain, and we will see you all next week.